Yeah, I think it's good. And I think it's very significant um, video in light of the series we're starting today called Mirrors. Um, mirrors. And I pose the question to start, what do I see when I look in a mirror? Don't get wise. <laughs> all the comics are coming out here already and elbows flying all over the place. But I'm not talking about what you actually see reflecting back at you because I see more reflection than most. Because <laughs> of the hair, that's a joke. <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm talking what the, the inner person. And I, and when you look at, we've described the world system. Well, I'm going to get back to that in a few moments. But I, we all have an inner image of what how we see ourselves. We we, and we have an we have a filter that we filter our self image, our self identity. I don't really want to get psychological here, but this is significant because how I. My self-identity is going to dictate my relationships. It's going to impact my marriage. It's going to impact my relationship with God. And some Christians, my friends, we go through our lives never ever really having a biblical self-identity. We go through our lives having a self-identity that was given to us or dictated to us or one that we have adopted that is far different than the ones God would will for us to have in our lives. That's why I see this as a significant series, because in, in the counseling arena, you find a lot, one of the things that we deal with initially and right out of the gate are people's self-identity. What makes people who they are? What makes them tick? Why do they think the way that they think? Why do they relate to themselves, relate to their parents, relate to their spouse, relate to their children? Why do they relate to them that way? What makes them think like that? And that's the goal of trying to help people is help them see it's interesting. Because in, in the counseling ministry, when, when, when you begin to show people, they call this pointing out their fleshly living patterns. That's what we were trained in. And um, once you show people, you do this because, and fill in the blank, it's different for all of us, they say, whoa, you're right. You're right. That is why I do it. That is why I think like this. That is why I'm the way that I am. And they think they're all better. <laughs> but they're not. They just know they're sick. <laughs> and, and then the next part of that is, okay, now that you realize your identity has been wrapped into the wrong thing, what are we going to do about it? What am I going to wrap it in? What can I sink my teeth into? And we want to talk about this the next three, four weeks here. Now, in your program, you have this, this self-esteem. This is, came from a, it's a Christian encyclopedia of psychology and counseling. I didn't, I'm not going to read that to you, but, and don't read it now because I'm going to be preaching. But, um, but, but read that because that will sort of add dimension to that video. That will define that video and bring even more clarity, clarity to what that says. I put that in the program so you could have it. But oftentimes, our identities are sort of like funhouse mirrors. You've been to the funhouse. You've never, only three of you have. Some of you have really bad childhoods. And, um, and, and you've been in the fun, you've been in those places, you know, you get in, they have the warped mirrors, and um, you get in there, and all of a sudden, you're, Bleh. it's like you've had pizza for nine days of straight, and, 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 or you're squished, and you're like, and you, and you just sort of look alienish and um, and stuff, and because, but they're not giving you a true reflection. That's not what you really look like. The mirror is dictating to you an image that isn't true. And my friends, we have these internal mirrors that dictate to us images that aren't true. And oftentimes these images and how we see ourselves and filter ourselves through never get resolved, never are really brought front and center. So we go through our lives with them. When it's not needed to do so. Sometimes these mirrors are dictated to us more times than not, interesting enough, by other people with distorted mirrors. I'm going to let your distorted mirror distort my mirror. I'm going to let your messed up mess me up. Most people, distortions are negative. But sometimes they're overinflated. Sometimes you can put somebody in an arena of praise, the praise of men, 
and the praise of men will get behind them, and the praise of men will go on year in and year out, and before you know it, they see themselves differently, just like the person who's on the other side of the spectrum. And their image is just as distorted because they think they're something that they're not. Some of you, if you've ever played sports in some way or another, you've been in pick-up sports games, pick-up basketball, pick-up football, pick-up baseball games. And so what happens, you always get a couple captains, and you say, okay, everyone line up over there. And then, and then everyone starts picking, and you got the guy, you know, okay, this guy's good, and, you, and you're just picking the best players you can. Each captain's picking the best players you can. But there's always three, three or four guys there that might not be that good. And they, and they might have all the gear and everything, but they're standing, they're standing, and they're thinking, they don't ever say this out loud, but they're thinking, I hope I'm not the last one picked. <laughs> I hope, well, there's five left. Well, now there's four left. Now there's three left. Now it's just me and him, this guy over here. And, and, and if, I'm, if I'm the last one picked, I'm, that means I stink at least a little bit more than him. I know he stinks, but I don't, I, I, I can't sink that bad, can I? <laughs> and, um, and sure enough, maybe the second to last one, the third to last one, but it means something, doesn't it? How your peers see you and how your peers relate to you means something to you. That's why we pursue it sometimes so adamantly to be approval by other people. What would cause a 90-pound girl to think they were overweight? A bad mirror. And it isn't a funhouse mirror either. It's a bad mirror. When you look at things in the, in the world system, well, let me just dive into this and I'll get, come back to that. A little bit. I want to talk about some of the most three most powerful influences on our identities, and then three truths that I want to hit before we get out of here at three o'clock in this afternoon. <laughs> I'm kidding you. And um, and so the first is the world system. First influencer of your identity, the world system. We call this the cosmos. Um, in our, our church vernacular, but it's the world system. You'll see in the Bible where the, anytime the Bible mentions the word world, it talks about, and the word is cosmos in the Greek New Testament, it, it talks about a system. And we know, without getting into that, in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, that Satan is the god of this world, this world system. We know in John 12.41 that he is the prince of this current age. He is. We know in 1 John 5.19b that this age that we're living in is infectiously evil. That's what the word means there. Aponaros, aponaros. And we, we, know, we know that in John 8.44 and Revelation 12.9 and 10 that the enemy, Satan, who's the god of this world, is also a pathological liar. That's what he has is lies in John 8, 44, and he lies so he can, Revelation 12, 9, deceive the whole world. So the, the world system, the cosmos, is just a system. It's not an entity. It's not a personality like the devil. It's just a system that he's put in place on planet Earth, and it's different in America than it would be in a third world. I don't face what the third world faces. They don't face what I face. I think it's probably harder here, not spiritually speaking. So this, this whole system we're living in is demonic in nature, and yet you and I are called out ones. We're the church. We're, we're strangers, pilgrims, and aliens called out to be a light in a mist of darkness in Philippians 2, verse 15. So we're called to live here, yet I live in this world. My parents live in this world. My grandparents live in this world. My friends live in this world. You've been through checkout stands. You look at the magazines. Everyone's perfect. The hair is perfect. It's flowing in the wind. Not mine, but, but, the, but, but and it's, um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a fan there. And you know those really beautiful girls have professional people to make them look beautiful? Some, no, that, no, that's the makeup artist I'm talking about. I'm, I'm getting to the Photoshop people. Because <laughs> when we did our article on People Magazine, those were the Photoshop people. 
I talked to these guys, and I said, hey, you know, can you do something about my head? And, and they said, we can do anything. We can make you look like anything. That's what he told me. I said, really? Could you add about six inches to my bicep? Could I, I wouldn't mind that. No, no, that would be impossible, he said. But, but, but we can do most anything. <laughs> So, but we look at these people, and we look at, we look at that magazine cover. That's beautiful. That's successful. That's what rich is. That's what famous is. And that's the standard. That's what we look up to. That's the ultimate right there. Now, we say we know that that's not the case, but do we? When I look into the reflection. Now, if you read it all, you know that many of these people that we see on these magazines and in these movies have very tortured lives. Many different fronts. I'm getting at, my friends, what the world system does. It takes 1% and say, that's normal. We're not going to talk about the rest of the 99% because that's so boring. But we're going to talk about that 1% and say that's normal. That's normal wealth. That's normal beauty. That's normal whatever it is. And that, or the pursuit of that, becomes our goal. How did that guy get abs like that? <laughs> Sometimes they're sprayed on. It's his job. To have abs like that. I could have abs like that, maybe, if it was my job, but it's not my job. Not this age, I wouldn't, but, but it's not my job. They, it's their job. These aren't their real identities. So the media becomes the world's mouthpiece, promotes its values, this world system, and I use it, my, I use it my, as my standard of beautiful. Ladies, you're hearing me. Guys, you're hearing me. Of successful of important, and it's not real. It's make-believe. The second and probably the most number one cause of our identities are our parents. Uninvolved parents. Neglectful parents. Verbally or physically abusive parents. Moms and dads, and especially you dads, be careful what you consistently say to your kids. And be careful how you say it. Because to these little kids, especially the real little ones, you're their image of God. And how you treat them is going to dictate to them and start defining God to them at a young age. If God, if you are indifferent to them, they think God's going to be indifferent. If they have to jump through hoops to make you happy, then you're going to jump through hoops to make God happy. If, if they have to f do somersaults to win your approval, to feel, feel like you're, they're accepted, then they'll think they have to do the same thing with God. So I loved about my daughter Hannah. She was, she was just the most relaxed kid in her own skin. She did not care what people thought of her, and she just didn't. Um, she just was relaxed in her own skin. She didn't want to do anything. She didn't do it. No one's going to put her through a mold. No one's going to get people coming. You should be teaching Sunday school. Nah, I'd rather sleep. <laughs> oh, you're a pastor's daughter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No one was, no was going to force her into a corner, paint her in a corner, and I'm not going to do it. I give that because her mom just poured so much into her life. Show me a child in a highly critical home, and I'll show you an adult who always thinks they need to earn God's approval. People and peers, number three, want to dictate to our self-identity. These can be influential people in our lives, bosses, anyone we might look up to, sports stars, or someone we may emulate, even pastors sometimes. I've watched many times through the last 30 years of ministry where a pastor falls and destroys people's lives. 
I've been on the backside of picking up the pieces of when a pastor sins and, and it disillu- people become disillusioned and sometimes they even lose and leave their faith because this particular man of God let them down and turned out to be human. Just like he always was from the beginning. Can I say to you, my friends, don't ever let a man of God do that to you. Don't ever let me do that to you. If I blow it, it doesn't mean that God's not on his throne. He is. And don't worry, God has me under control, and so does my wife. So, yeah. Well, my wife will beat me. God won't. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, um, so don't ever worry about that, but just be careful because I've watched, I've watched as leaders, I've watched, the, I've watched the, the, the ramifications of errant lifestyles and what it does to people. We want approval and affirmation so bad, sometimes we would virtually do anything. Being in the chapel service sometimes and for years being with professional baseball players and working in the hotel industry and working with movie stars and stuff like this, it was amazing to watch the um, price of fame from both directions. The people that would do anything to gain an approval by one of these superstars, to have a picture taken to anything for anything. And sometimes the superstars just begging for a little privacy. You ever wonder why people stay in abusive relationships? I do. When somebody's abusive verbally, physically, and it goes on for a year, two, five, 10, 15 years later, and then all of a sudden, you, and, and that's it, I can't take this anymore, and then Prince Charming or Princess Charming comes back and says, I'm so sorry, for the 150th time. And we say, okay. Like a Bugs Bunny rerun. You see him all the time. Why do we do that? Because you hate what we see in the mirror. The mirror is looking back at us. And we need that person, despite their abuse. I'll roll the dice because right now that's the only person that is giving me any value. Relationships in schools can mold us, good or bad, for a lifetime if we're not careful. You can see, can't we, how, why so many are so messed up? <laughs> you can see why our public school system and our high schools are, are such war zones. And what happens with these young folks, they, my friends, they grow up and they become adults. And dysfunctional teenagers become dysfunctional adults. And teenagers with poor identities become adults with poor identities. The scene changes, the people change, relationships change, but the problem remains. And there's no resolution. It's just band-aids on a gaping hole that needs to be fully healed. Let me give you a verse right, John 8, 32. You know the verse, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many believe that? Okay, all but four. Uh, we, we, um, we, I'm about to show you some truth. You believe what Jesus said? It will set you free? Then please, for the next 15, 20 minutes, focus on some of the things I'm going to be sharing with you. You've heard them before, but maybe you need to hear them with your inner man. Because the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit and the bones and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart in Hebrews 4.12. And the Word of God in Psalm 107, verse 20, was sent to heal you. The Word of God in Ephesians 5.26 was sent to cleanse you. It becomes a light to help you think. Psalm 119 someplace. <laughs> it's a big psalm. <laughs> it becomes a light to you as you try to walk through this life. Now, let's start in the book of Ephesians here. We're just going to go through it right to Revelation. 
Oh, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. I'm going, to, I'm going to spend the first six verses. Now, actually, we could spend this whole series in the book of Ephesians, but I just want to plop, plow through this a little bit, do a little bit of exegesis for you, but really get to the last three main points. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints. That's a wonderful word, saint. That means you're special, by the way. That's what that word saint means. It means you're special. It doesn't mean you act saintly, because I know you don't. But, it means, but it, means, it means you're set apart to God. That's what that means, that word saint. It's the same root word as holy, holy agios. So, where was I? To the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful. Now, I'm going to spend a moment here. In Christ Jesus. Those three words, my friends, are probably the most prolific, powerful words in the New Testament. In Christ Jesus. You read that in your English Bible, or we read it casually, and we sort of just blow over it and not really put the emphasis to it. But that means being in Christ Jesus. And by the way, Paul uses that over 130 times in the New Testament, and over about 65 or 70 times in the book of Ephesians alone. In Christ Jesus. That is a very, very significant three words or in the Lord, or however, but it's the same structure. And it means, not that, it means that when, when we ask Jesus Christ to be our Savior, we are placed in Christ. You are not made righteous. You are given Christ's righteousness. You are not made holy. You are placed inside the holiness of Jesus Christ. You were brought into the family of God, we'll see in a moment. You were placed in Christ. So when God looks down at Tim Kelly, he doesn't see Tim Kelly trying his hardest. He sees Christ, who's already fulfilled the law, redeemed man, and is sitting on the right hand of the Father. He's placed me in him. My identity has been placed in Christ, in, in God's eyes. I don't have that. So God looks down at Tim and says, Tim is never going to get his act together. That guy was weird 20 years ago. He's weird today. But God sees, is Jesus, there's Tim in his idiosyncrasies, in his personality, in his fears, the place where he's strong, all those things. He sees him as being in Christ. That's another series right there. Grace and peace from God our Father in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm sorry, grace and peace to what? To moi. That's French. You, grace and peace, is that French? That sounds good to me. And um, if you don't know it, then it is. <laughs> it's French. Grace and peace to you. Now, this is God talking. Paul's saying, this is God. Grace, God's unmerited favor and mercy, and peace, arene, which is the shalom of God. It means well-being. So God looking at the human race and saying, grace to you and well-being to you. What do you mean, God? Aren't you mad at me? I'm mad at me. God, aren't you fed up with me? I'm fed up with me. God, aren't you sick of my inconsistencies? I'm sick of my inconsistencies. God, aren't you mad because I don't pray enough, read the Bible enough, evangelize enough, give enough? I, God, there's a lot of things I'm not doing enough of. And there's a lot of things that I shouldn't be doing. I'm doing plenty of that. <laughs> I'm not really happy with God. With me, God. God says, grace and well-being to you. Why? Because you're in Christ, not in yourself. See, God's grace, God's desire without anything required in response. Verse 3, incredible verse. Sets the stage for the rest of the book. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. These spiritual blessings quickly are, are the same blessings we have, will have in the heavenly realm, but they're not reserved for us them now, my friends. They're for us now. So the same spiritual blessings we'll have of being in Christ when we're in eternity forever are available to us now in these bodies of clay and death. Know what you should say after that? Hallelujah. Well, I was thinking, woohoo! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, hallelujah works, but it's probably more biblical than woohoo. But so I would go with hallelujah, because woohoo's not in the Bible. He may might be in the New Living or something. <laughs> but so woohoo. And um and then, hallelujah, that's what it means. My I'm placed in Christ. Think of that. And the, the blessings are realized when we understand 
we am, and we start embracing and meditating and thinking about this in Christ relationship. Verse 4, and even as he chose us in him, same structure, same meaning, in him, he chose us in him, in Christ, as sons, because we're in Christ, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us, accepted us, in your King James, in, in the beloved, beloved being Jesus, in the beloved. So if we are in Christ, and we are, as a saint, I'm placed in Christ the moment I'm born again. If I'm in Christ, then everything I just read in verses 1 through 6 is true for you and for me. And for everyone sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, it's true. It's not partially true. It's may not may be true. It's true. That's how God sees you. I didn't see myself that way, but God sees me that way. I'm, I'm trading my mirrors in. I might have a worldly mirror, a parental mirror, or a peer mirror, but I say, wait a minute, those aren't right mirrors. Those are like the funhouse mirrors. They make me look warped. But now I'm given an option. God's saying, no, you don't have to see yourself that way. So three mirrors I want to bring out of this portion of Scripture. Number one, the mirror of being wanted. Doesn't that have a great sound to it? I'm looking out over the, uh, over the congregation today, and some of you are wanted by the police. <laughs> but, but, well, just Jeanette. But, but, it, but, but, it, but it's, um, but the rest, but... That's not what is meant here. <laughs> Couldn't resist. It was just so easy. <laughs> and um, it means that we are chosen in him. We're being wanted. We're chosen in him. I, I, I believe the invitation of the cross, the wonderful cross, extends to the entire human race. It's an invitation to relationship. Now, again, the mirror of being wanted. John 15, 15 and verse 16. Let's, let's read those verses. This is, some, I think, some of the... Coolest verses in the New Testament, in the Gospels. I no longer call you slaves because, because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. For I have told you everything the Father told me. I didn't choose me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. So I use that word friend there. Now, I'm not going to get into the etymology of all this in the Greek, but is, is, when, I, when I talk about love, and most of you know that the Greek word for love is agape, primary Greek word for love. There's four of them, but that's the primary Greek word, agape, agape love, God's unconditional love. Amazing word, it's full of rich, richness, and God loves us beyond condition. Anything, we can't escape it, we can't change it, it's unconditional love. This isn't that word. This word is mostly translated love, but here it's translated friend. This is a word called phileho. It's a good word. It's just not as thorough as agape would be, maybe, in certain ways. But phileho has a nuance to it that, that agape doesn't have. This unconditional love means that we can't change it, and that's true. But phileho means that God doesn't only love us. This is important. He likes us. Mom always told me that God loved me. But I never really believed that God liked me. Because there wasn't a lot about me that I thought was likable. This is huge. Because most of us live our Christian lives, many of us live Christian lives thinking that somehow we are inferior to other Christians. Somehow we'll never add up to the super spiritual or something like that. And somehow I'm doing something not enough, doing things too much. And somehow my relationship with God is conditional. It is not. Your relationship with Jesus is in Christ. So he says, it is an invitation of, of, um, of relationship. I want you. I don't need to have you. I want you. I love the church of Christ. I love Christian brethren. And I do. I can honestly say I just love people unconditionally. But I don't phileo everybody. In other words, I don't like everyone, but I love everybody. There's a difference. You know what I mean. You love the whole world. You want to bless. Yeah, I love you. But I'm only phileho and the people that come over for Thanksgiving, I phileho them. 
I actually like them. I have something in common with them. There's a mutual thing. My relationship is, is fuller because they're in it. My life is better. I phileo them. I, I love them. They're, they're, they're my friends. God says, I love you. You're my friend. It's, it's, I take you just the way that you are. In all your idiosyncrasies, all your little weirdness, I love you just the way that you are. In fact, get me, listen to me. He breathed life into you, didn't he? He breathed life into me. He gave me my, in my mind. He gave me emotions. He gave me feelings. He gave me the need for affirmation. He gave me the need for love and approval. All these things. He made, gave me my DNA. I am who I am because of the breath of God. That makes me human. God doesn't say, I just really like, I love everyone, but I just like certain people that act more like I would want them to act? No. There's an invitation. God loves you just the way that you are. Let me promise you something. Man doesn't. Man will love you conditionally, or at least moderately conditionally. But God just accepts you just the way that you are, despite yourself. He likes your personality. Your spouse may not, but he does. He likes the idiosyncrasies. He likes the weird little things that you do. He likes you. Because he likes you, he loves spending time with you. Second mirror, the mirror of being accepted. This relates back to being adopted in the, in the passage. <clears throat> Most of the people that we see in a biblical adoption, the scenario of biblical adoption, not always, but many of these people, they had, I'll, I'll call it, some nasty in their life. They had stuff in their past, and when they were adopted, their past was obliterated, and they took on a brand new identity of the adoptive parent. And that's the biblical picture of adoption, by the way, that all of our, our nasty, our past, criminal records, I'm talking in the actual adoption of, of, of the ancient days, would disappear. It's like I never existed before. And my life would now be anchored in the, in the reputation and the blessings of that new family. So we've been, we've been adopted. We've been accepted. We've been, we're wanted, but only just wanted. We're accepted. If my parents were abusive, I, God accepts me. If I had a perverted relative in my life who violated my innocence, that doesn't mean that God doesn't accept me. If I lived a life rejected or isolated from my peers, I don't have to do that anymore because God accepts me. I was told a story this past week tore my heart out. A young lady who had a great loss of a sibling in her life recently. Young teenager. Made a failed attempt to take her own life. Get this. She went back to her Christian school. And a few of the folks went up to her in the Christian school and said, we wish you were successful. That's our Christian school. We need this message. <laughs> this young lady needs to hear something other than that. Bad decisions. Ever make one? Yep. Yeah, one did. <laughs> Stupid relationship after stupid relationship, never learning, still looking for a man or woman to meet those deep needs. Maybe it's something that happened in your past, my friends, follow me, and there's a claw of guilt in your head. A claw of guilt. Maybe it was so deeply dark that you never even voiced it to another person. Maybe one or two. But you can't get over that you actually did it, whatever it is. You can't get over that you actually were that dark at that point in your life. So you're still going through the motions of trying to please God and pay God back and climbing the mountain of guilt, thinking at some point you'll do enough good things you can come down the other side of the mountain, but you never really get to the top. Secret sins, secret failures, 
I call it the nasty. And sometimes it's the nasty, nasty. And this is, this is what I want to get at. This means despite all the nasty, God has brought you into his family. He receives you as his son and placed you in Christ. God knows about the nasty. He knows what happened when you were a teenager. He knows what happened in secret places. He knows the bad decisions you made. He knows, he knows you because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows everything about your life. And he chose you, and he accepts you, and he wants you, and he brings you into his family, and he wants to be your friend despite the nasty. There's a lot of people who want to bring up the nasty. To heck <laughs> with those people who want to bring up the nasty. I was good. I almost said it. I was good. I was in big trouble when I got home. I said that. <laughs> to heck with those people. To heck with anyone who tries to tell you otherwise, whether it's a person or a demon from hell that you aren't accepted in the beloved. It's never about your nasty. I'm sick and tired of mirror bullies. People who just want to point the reflection out or give you a reflection. Let me tell you something. This is on the other side of the coin. I can't blame anyone for my identity. I let people afflict me. Unless it's physical and it was just forced upon me as a young person. But I'm this way because that person, no, you did it that way because you choose to believe something. I'm not going to let any man or woman have authority over how I see myself. I'm not going to let any man or a woman define me and put me in their box and try to make me who they want me to be. It ain't going to happen. Because I have something higher than that? Think with me. I'm going to close here in the next four hours. <laughs> I'll have you all by time for the buffet. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God prepared for them that love them. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ever ask or think. Think of those verses. And you know this, I've taught this, those verses are talking about this right here, this life in here, this life up here. That's what it's talking about. God's saying, Paul saying, I can do, Jesus can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you ever ask or think in here. He can make you a real person. He can heal you in your inner man. He can take care of the nasty. He can take the nasty right out of your life and make it like a blip in your past. He can give you a brand new identity and make you new from the inside out so you won't even recognize yourself. You won't even see yourself. It's called being transformed from glory to glory and being conformed into his image. That's what the gospel has done for us. Last point, the mirror of significance. Quickly. So we're wanted, we're accepted, and then there's a deep significance being the church of Jesus Christ placed on you. There's a purpose for your life. Whether you're sick in bed, whether you, feel, you deal with uh, physical illnesses and you can't ever be active in ministry, whether you're in a wheelchair or whether you're young, the middle or the old, it doesn't matter. There's a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life and he's working his purpose through your life. Your life, every life that, that, that has named the name of Jesus Christ has incredible significance to it. Every life. Even the lives that are screwed up, even the lives that have a lot of nasty, even the lives that have the claw of guilt, even the lives that have failed over and over again, even the lives that have police records, and even the lives that have divorced five times, those lives have significance. You know why they have significance? Because you're in Christ. And Christ has significance, wouldn't you say? So in all the universe, God chooses me and you for high and holy purpose. Ordained, our life is ordained with value. Verse 11 of Ephesians 1. Just I'm going to plow, plow you through Ephesians in a little bit and we'll close. We have a divine inheritance. Think of that, divine inheritance. Verse 11, you just kept reading down, you'd find it. Verse 12, 
we uh, become a source of praise to God. Ephesians 1, 12, same thing being taught in Ephesians 2, verse 7. We become a source of praise to God. God gets praised because of us. In Ephesians 2, 7, I love that verse. It says, for the ages to come, he's able to show the exceeding riches of his grace towards, somehow, I forget what translation I'm quoting. They got six of them being mixed up in one. And, um, and it, means that, it means that in the ages to come, the angels look at me and Andre Panu in heaven. More Andre than me. I'm just picking, that was, that was a total dig. And, um, and, and, they said, and they start praising God because we're there. And we're part of God's family. That's what Ephesians 2, 7 is teaching us. We, God gives us his power, verse 19. He makes us his representative heads on earth, Ephesians 1, 22. And he gives us good works that he purposed to work in our life and through our life in Ephesians 2, 10. We have significance. So, to wrap it up. He gives us truth for what? Set us free. John 8, 32. We have this truth to set us free. I just gave us truth. Not my truth. I just told you it was there. It's pretty simple. He just gave us truth. This truth is to set me free. Do you, you want to hang on to an identity that's dictated by the world system, by, your, by parents that were anything less than perfect, by your peers or people and peers? Do you want that identity that you can hang on to that, but how's it working for you? Or I want to be free. I want to be free in here. In here. I want to be free here. Make me free in here, God. Burn it in me that I am wanted by you. It doesn't matter about them. I'm wanted by you. They really, really, really don't matter. <laughs> they don't. You see me as significant and having a great purpose in my life. And you accept me even with my nasty. Dear Jesus, thank you for these precious words and these precious people. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we do every service here at Grace Connection, if, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior, we'd like to give you that opportunity right now. Salvation is a free gift. Just ask. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Come into my life and save me.